I'm Nasima McElroy, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. I once knew a doctor, a plastic surgeon who made well over $500,000 a year, and she was constantly on the verge of bankruptcy. She lived in the nicest area with the biggest house. Her kids went to the finest private schools and camps, and she was maxed out on all her credit cards and had a whopping line of credit. We often think of financial problems as income problems. A high-paying job can solve everything, right? But for my friend, the plastic surgeon, there was no such thing as enough. A failing she paid for when a healthcare crisis finally tipped her into actual bankruptcy and she lost her practice and her perfectly decorated home in her sought-after neighborhood. You see, even those of us with a high salary can become a victim of debt. Even they, with all the money coming in, need to be financially intentional. Nasima McElroy is the founder of Financially Intentional, a blog about personal finance and living life intentionally. She discusses how taking control of her finances has enabled her to overcome bankruptcy, divorce, and break the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. She paid off $1 million in debt and grew a six-figure net worth in three years without living in deprivation. Nasima McElroy, welcome back to Earn and Invest. Tell me, you weren't always good with money, were you? You know what? I was always good at making money, but <laughs> making money and keeping money is two different things. So I really had to learn that difference, but that didn't come until later in life. Tell me about some of those early mistakes. Like, What were you doing wrong in the beginning? I just did not understand how to properly just... First of all, I was never taught about money. I use money as a survival me- mechanism, like you know, earning money as a child was so that I had lunch money. So I had money for the things that I needed because I was raised by a single dad and he didn't have a lot of disposable income. He gave us what he could, but you know, we didn't have a lot. So if I wanted anything besides the bare minimum, the necessities, I would have to earn it on my own. But there was no money lessons taught in there of like how to save, the importance of saving, the uh, the importance of growing your your money, the importance of even just a rainy day fund. It was all survival. And those things followed me into adulthood. I remember going into college and, you know, that was before it was illegal for credit card companies to be on the campus. And they, you know, lined the, the center of the courtyard the main courtyard in college with these tables for like free t-shirts and frisbees to sign up for credit cards. And me kind of calling my dad, like, do you think I should get a credit card? And he was like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And that's it. So (laughs) I didn't even know how to manage that. And so I just spent on the credit card. I just, but had no plans and, and did not know like to pay it off. I just paid the minimum. My freshman year in college, my stepmother told me that she was going to deposit like $100 a month into my account. And me saying, okay, she said she was going to do this, just writing checks on that account, not even checking that account, and then ending up in check systems at 18 years old for writing bad checks. So (laughs) that's how I like started into adulthood with my money, like automatically at a negative place. Did your father or your stepmother model any positive behaviors? I mean, I look back at my story and I say, oh, my parents saved lots of money. They invested. They side hustled. Did you get any of that from your dad or your stepmom? No, I remember my dad being really bad with money because I remember bill collectors constantly calling our house and us like either like having to lie about him not being home or, you know, just not answering the phone. That was, you know, when they was they were like constantly calling in my youth. So I I remember that. And then with my stepmom, I just remember her being like always like an entrepreneur, not that like always kind of like just making it, not really having a lot, never really having a lot to give. But that was what was modeled for me. <laughs> So it sounds like debt was fairly normal for you growing up. Let's talk about your original career aspirations. You're a nurse now. You run labor and delivery departments. But what did you originally start doing as a career? 
initially I went into healthcare administration. It's funny. I actually wanted to be a doctor. And then when I signed up for OCHEM and then started talking to doctors and realizing what they actually did, I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do that. I went into healthcare because I wanted to change how people access healthcare. I grew up in the 80s and 90s when health insurance was a little bit different than it was today. And so my dad wasn't poor enough to qualify for state, you know, Medicaid, Medicaid, uh, yeah, Medicaid, right? I always want to call it Medi-Cal because that's what it's called in California, Medicaid. And, but he, he never had a job that offered health insurance. And so my access to care was at community clinics and I had really, really bad asthma as a kid. And imagine like him trying to go to like the drugstore to buy me uh, whatever that generic as a medic, uh, inhaler is, and it ne- never works. Or, and he also like was believed in a uh, Western medicine. I mean, believed in Eastern medicine. So we would go to Chinatown and I had to drink these nasty teas <laughs> that were great, but they didn't work for acute asthma attacks. So then we would send, spend hours in community clinics just trying to get an inhaler. And so that's why I wanted to go into healthcare. And once I realized that doctors don't necessarily affect the system as a provider, I want to do something different. And so I went into healthcare administration, focused on that undergrad, and then got a master's in healthcare administration. And then as an administrator of one of the largest um, healthcare organizations in California, I was like, oh, well, this is (laughs) healthcare administrators don't do that either. Healthcare administrators is really bureaucratic. It was really bureaucratic. And I felt like it was hurting our members more than it was actually benefiting. That's when I went into nursing because I worked with so many nurses and I loved what they did. So it was a big pivot, a very expensive pivot, though. So you grew up with scarcity and debt. You now are going into the professional world. How important was income? Like, So you're looking at what do I want to do for a living How do I want to affect the world? But did money play a role? Were you like, I'm going to make a high income and that's going to solve my problems that we had during childhood? You know what? Income never really came into play. It was more about like, (laughs) for us, it was like, you know, if you all get out the hood, you're going to go to the best schools and you're going to get a good job, a good stable job and work that job forever. And then you'll be okay. It wasn't like, I, I never looked at the cost of education. I was just like, get into the school by any means necessary. And then I kind of looked at the income of a job, but it wasn't in comparison to like, oh yeah, I have this much in student loan debt. I better make sure that I'm getting paid at least this. Like I was never taught that. I, I didn't know. I just like, for me, it was about prestige. It was about like, I got into USC, which is a really good program. So that was, that was, I, I checked that box. And then I got into this really competitive fellowship out of my master's program, which like two people out of thousands in the country got into. So for me, that was prestigious enough to be like, okay, like you've made it, but never income, salary, none of those things. I think I made like $50,000 going into that program in 2005. That's interesting. And I think we see this a lot, right? And people who don't necessarily grow up with money, the ticket out is quote unquote, education or the ticket out is quote unquote, a good job, not necessarily the dollars and cents, but it's what these things mean. So people are willing to go into a lot of debt to get these things because they think that's going to solve their problems. Would that kind of describe where you were at? That's exactly where I was at. Yeah. And so you were kind of living up to your expectations, right? You were going to these incredible institutions. You were getting these really good jobs. And yet you found yourself on the verge or maybe even in the midst of bankruptcy. What happened? (laughs) I I was doing all the things into the outside world. It looked like I was doing really well. I mean, I was the first person in my family to get a master's degree. I worked for this big hospital organization that everybody knew and recognized. But I also thought, okay, and when I was in grad school, I need to start like investing. I need to start like kind of figuring out my money. Like what are the next steps? And it wasn't even about investing. It was like, okay, like checking boxes again. Like what's the next step after you've got the job, you know, you, you, you went to college, what are you supposed to do next? You're supposed to buy a house. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I bought my first condo in Inglewood, California. And I was like, cool. And then all my, um, I had a couple of friends, like actually side note, I always had a side hustle where I braided hair in college. 
and it was at a shop. And next to the shop was a real estate company. So my friend owned the real estate company. And so they helped me buy my first condo. And then do you know who Patrice Washington is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So me and Patrice, we went to college together. And at that time, I don't know if you know her like bad backstory, but at that time, Patrice and her husband had started a real estate company when they were specializing in investing. And so they were me and because me and Patrice were really good friends. She was like, well, you know, I think like you got this property, you should like try to build up more properties. And so from 2005 to 2007, I acquired five properties. So my, my res- primary residence and then four other income properties, you know, investment properties. And, <laughs> she's, doing, uh, <laughs> she's doing quotes as she's saying this for those people who can't see our video here, but she's, she's doing the air quotes as she says income properties. Yeah. yeah but it, you know, it all started off really, really well, but listen to the years that I told you 2005 to 2007, I was acquiring these properties. So everything was good. But again, you know, that was a subprime lending era. That was all these illegal loans they were putting out here. And then of course (laughs) the market, the housing market crashed. So, um, and, and in 2007 was when I was finishing up my fellowship at this big organization. And I realized that this is not what I wanted to do. And so I had quit my job because I was like, I told them I was retiring because I was a millionaire at 25. I thought I would get there at 30. Technically with my assets, I was because of all the properties that I had, um, at 25, but they weren't cash flow. I wasn't a cash flow millionaire. It was just on paper. Right. And so I told them I was retiring, but I really, I was going back to nursing school. And so it kind of put me in a place where the market, the housing market was crashing. These homes were losing value. People weren't paying their rent. And so I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. And so eventually I kept my primary residence, but then I had to file bankruptcy because I had two short sales and two foreclosures. And these lenders kept on, even though they were already closed out, kept on reporting late payments on my credit. So the only way I can get out of this mess was to file bankruptcy. So um, all that in my my mid twenties. So that was how I got into the world of investing. (laughs) Tell me about that. I mean, so you're talking about rock bottom, right? You grew up in this place where you always had scarcity, but it doesn't sound like bankruptcy was a big part of your childhood. You are calling yourself a paper millionaire. You're getting planning on retiring by 30. The real estate market drops out and you hit rock bottom. You have to foreclose and short sale. You eventually have to declare bankruptcy. What made you turn right then? Like, What was the person or resource or thing that you grabbed onto and said, okay, here's how I'm going to climb my way back up. You know what? I, I I didn't have anyone really. I just got to a place where it took a couple of years for that process to happen, you know? And so I, I did a year in nursing school and I got into a job where I was finally making decent enough money where I was at kind of like at zero, but not counting my student loans because I never counted my student loans because who does that? Like everybody has student loans, right? So for me, I felt like I was at zero. My my debt was kind of wiped out. I didn't have any credit card debt because I got wiped out with the bankruptcy and I was finally, you know, making a little bit of money. And so I felt like I was beginning life again, but all I knew again was to earn money And then I knew that I had to do something with my loans. And so I just put my um, student loans on the loan forgiveness program and I was set, right? So a couple of years later, I just realized after I had my first daughter, I was like, okay, I've been making six figures for a couple of years and I'm still at the same place. I'm not any better. But, you know, but I was still doing the things. I had this big old house because that's what I was supposed to do, right? Again, I was back at a point where my my credit had recovered so I can finally buy a house again. Bought my first house, sitting in this house with my daughter who was about to turn one. And I'm just looking like, 
Hey, make too much money to be this broke. And I don't understand how to change this. I need to learn how to do better financially. And again, I thought it was like, I needed to learn how to invest because real estate investing didn't work out for me. So maybe investing in the stock market is what I need to learn. But I thought that that was going to take a PhD level of like concentration in order to learn that. And I'm like, finally, I'm at a point where I'm out of school. I can do this. Let me start learning about investing. And just started Googling blogs I can listen to on my hour commute to work and discover, you know, Dave Ramsey and later, you know, the fire community, but really just step by step, like implementing the things that I learned. That's where I got to the point where I was able to pay off my million dollars in debt. (laughs) So bankruptcy didn't solve the problem. Having a high income didn't solve the problem. But ultimately, looking at your life and saying, I'm making too much money not to be better off did talk about Dave Ramsey. I mean, he's kind of the gateway drug, isn't he, for a lot of people? He is. He is. And the thing is, is like initially I was really turned off because I'm just like, what is this? How does this white evangelical Christian? I grew up Muslim, so I'm like, you know. (laughs) I'm always leery of people who are super like Christian. So I'm like, how is this guy going to help me with my problems? At that point, because of all my degrees, I had like $200,000 in student loan debt and, you know, just lifestyle inflation debt. And I was just like, he doesn't understand, you know, what I'm going through. But what really compelled me was were these debt-free screens on the show where people who are making far less than me were able to make such good financial strides. And I was like, okay, I might not jive with him, but there has to be some relevancy in what he's saying. So I need to at least like follow these steps. And so I went on a path. I did the zero-based budgeting. I did the um, debt snowball and I just started attacking my debt. And the reason why my um, company is called, uh, my business is called Financially Intentional is because it wasn't about how much money I made. It wasn't about, you know, like spending less and being in deprivation. It was about just being intentional about where my money went. And that's what changed everything for me. It was that intentionality and that focus on making my money work for me that changed everything for me. Let's talk about the fruits of your labor. I mean, you went from being a million dollars in debt to now having a six-figure net worth in a very short period of time, just a number of years. First of all, tell us what that debt was made up of and what do you think were the biggest things that help you that help you get rid of that million dollars of debt so quickly? A lot of my debt, of course, was my student loans. I took out a loan <laughs> to put a down payment on my house. I had car loans because, of course, I had to have my luxury car. Then I had to have my commuter car. And then just like miscellaneous stuff. Like what I don't often talk about is like through this process, like I got married (laughs) and I got divorced. Like it was in the the whole process was about two and a half years. But my marriage was actually less than a year. So I had some of his debt that was combined because we were following day friends. We combine everything together, list your debt smallest to largest. So I actually paid off all of his debt. He's totally debt free while he was sitting in jail for <laughs> abusing me. That's another story. But it was it was really just the those regular debts that everybody has, right? You're normal, right? You have a house, you have a car. It was nothing like crazy, but the million dollars really came because at the end of my journey, after I had about $50,000 to pay off, I did sell my house. And that was about $500,000 of that million dollars that was left on my debt. Let's talk about that divorce, if you don't mind for a moment. Mm, No problem. What effect do you think it had on your trajectory? First and foremost, did you have a prenup? Was there any pre-financial planning before you got married? No. So (laughs) listening to Dave Ramsey, you know, like I kind of leaned on like what he thought about like marriage and combining finances because I was trying to follow the baby steps and stuff. And so the only kind of caveat um, I had for my 
my husband was that we do Financial Peace University together so that we can be on the same page financially. And we were, we budgeted together. We shared a budget, like we agreed on how we were spending. We agreed on what debt was to be paid off. We had a joint account, all that stuff. So no prenup came into play because I thought like before we got married, we like would discuss everything and we knew where we would be financially. Um, (laughs) And like I said, the marriage quickly turned to something that was really abusive. He ended up going to jail, but you know, me being the faithful wife still, if his debt was next, it would get paid off and his debts were smaller than mine. So on the debt snowball, it got paid off. So um, I just remember being in the court, paying off all his debt and being married less than a year and him saying, your honor, she only let me live off of a hundred dollars. She took all my money and only let me live off a hundred dollars a month. And that was like his allocated, just like spending money. But I was like, he turned it all around on me. And then I still had to pay him to get out a settlement, to get out of my uh, marriage. That was like a big lesson. And it really scarred me from like wanting to ever get married again. Talk about some of the financial hardships also of just having a spouse in legal trouble. I mean, it's kind of expensive, right? You know what? It is crazy, though. It's very expensive. But as but because I had turned on that intentionality and I was looking at my money like we made it work because what happened was is that, you know, I went from having like zero savings to like paying off like $6,000 a month in in debt, right? Just because just by like paying attention to where my money goes. People say, "Oh, that's a that's a lot." But I had been making the same amount of money. And actually, I um people say, "Oh, well, you must have worked more or side hustle." No, I did not work more because I had my baby. I used to have a husband that was there to help me take care of her, but I actually had to work less. But I made it work. Paid all the legal fees, cash, just, you know, put it as part of our budget. It was it was a hardship. But it would have been way harder if I did not already have this plan in place. And so that's actually, actually, what the crazy part about it is, that's kind of how I started financially intentional. Because I just remember writing in a journal to him every day while he was in jail, like every day, and being like, this is how I plan to pay off this debt. Like, this is what we're going to do. This is how much money we brought in. And like being really intentional about like looking at all the money. And I was like, if I can do this for this, and I want to say a bad word, but <laughs> if I can do this for this person, I can do this for myself. And I need to start sharing this. So I was like, you know what? I need to start sharing this to other people with other people, just the lessons that I learned and the and the techniques that I use to actually pay off this debt and attack these real time like money problems that were coming up, emergencies, right? That were coming up and how manageable it was just because I shifted that relationship with my money. We are talking to Nasima McElroy. She is the founder of Financially Intentional, a blog about personal finance and living life intentionally. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Hey, everybody. I hope you're all having a great holiday season. The holidays are coming up. If you're looking for gifts, I'd like to suggest to you my book, Taking Stock. This is a great book for anyone in your life who's contemplating the role money plays. I see this especially in middle-aged people, people who've accumulated some wealth but then don't know what to do with that money. But I also think it's important for young people who are struggling to decide what their career should look like, what role money should play in their lives, how much they need to make, When should they retire? How many hours a week should they work? Should they go after serial entrepreneurship or should they work for an employer? All of these are questions the book helps answer. The easiest way to find out more is to go to earnandinvest.com slash book. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash book. I hope you have a great holiday season. Now back to the show. 
Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Nisima McElroy. She paid off $1 million in debt and grew a six-figure net worth in three years without living in deprivation. Nisima, we were just talking about your divorce. You're now a few years past that. Are there any financial repercussions from that time in your life, or do you feel like you've moved past it? Oh, <laughs> still lessons, still a lot of lessons. I, I moved past that. So when I sold my house and and to in 2017. And when I got debt free, I was able to put that financial burden behind me. But what ended up happening is, is that when I was with the daughter of, I mean, (laughs) when I was with my um, youngest daughter's father, I was so reluctant to get married that I was like, we can enter into a domestic partnership. And the only reason why I even agreed to enter into a domestic partnership is because we had decided to move states. Therefore, I was going to lose my health benefits, even though I still worked at the same place. I went per diem versus having full-time position with health benefits. And so I had to get on his health benefits. And so I became a domestic partner again, not knowing that a domestic partnership, once you have children or share property is treated legally the same as a marriage, as far as when Mm. you separate, because you technically have to get a divorce, split assets and all of that kind of stuff. So when we broke up in that same process, reared his hair head again, plus on top of like child custody. And so it was only compounded. And, uh, and <laughs> so I had to go through the same thing again, not knowing that, you know, if I had like a prenup in place, it wouldn't have happened. And so um, that trauma, I, <laughs> even though I tried to avoid it, I, I I did not get out of it. And it happened to me again, more recently, plus having to battle in family court, which is no, like, I I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's horrible. So let's talk about your life today, Nasima. You are working as a nurse. We talked a little bit about your career trajectory and this idea of you wanted to make a difference. You wanted to affect healthcare. Do you feel like you're doing that now as a nurse? You know, with everything like <laughs> is I, I think I'm doing that with my platform. Um, but as a nurse, I feel like I get to affect just and especially in labor and delivery, people's lives just day to day. And to me, that is so impactful because everybody remembers their birth experience, even in times where things don't turn out the way that they're supposed to, with demises or with more maternal morbidity and mortality, to be able to be in those rooms with those people is like my job is so rewarding. And I always say, I'm just like a a bedside nurse, but the impact that I have on my patients to me is really profound. And so I love that. And I feel like with my platform, what I'm able to do is highlight some of those things that happen on a larger scale and bring them to public awareness so that I can affect change. Because now I have firsthand experience in a lot of the things that happen, especially around Black morbidity and mortality. And so I feel like I'm able to do that. And I I think it's cool that, you know, I can use my platform to affect change and things that I'm passionate about in my professional career. As your finances get better and better, your net worth gets higher and higher. There's always this push to follow the script of financial independence, retire early, right? You get to a certain point and then you leave your job. Has it crossed your mind, this idea of leaving nursing, or do you think it's something you're always going to do? Initially, it was like this lure of, oh my God, so I don't have to work forever. And I'm just like, I'm going to quit. And I always threaten that I'm going to quit. I mean, like, like that's my, that's my clutch, right? That's my thing. <laughs> like, whenever my evaluations come around and uh, I'm just like, uh, what's your what's your goal to retire early, right? But in all honesty, I really think that nursing is a cheat code. And a short the short answer to your question is I probably won't quit nursing because, like I said, like it is something that I'm truly passionate about, and it's really easy versus like running a business. To me, it's really easy. Like I go to work, I really am able to like lean in on my patients, and then I get to come home. I make a really, really good salary. I have really good benefits. I have a lot of flexibility in my job. So, like, why would I leave that? Because most people want to retire into something like that, right? 
And then there's just so many levers to pull in nursing. And I have so much experience across the board and so many th- areas of expertise that I can, you know, lean into if I want to fall back, if I want to do consulting, if I want to go into management, which I never will. If, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just like so many different options. And then like the cross section between like me having a business and growing communities within nursing has led me to a lot of different opportunities as well. And so I think the the real goal of FIRE is that work optional piece. It's that piece to know that you aren't reliant on these jobs. The other way, it's the other way around. Like the way you make money just supports the lifestyle that you want to live. And when you once you get to that point, it kind of doesn't matter what you're doing for an income or if you're getting it, if you're getting an income. And so for me, it's just like, yeah, I'll probably do nursing. I can take like half a year off if I want to take my kids around the world and then come back and do it. So it'll look different every year, but I'll probably always be a nurse. I was about to say, have you found that maybe you're decreasing your hours as you're building up financially intentional and doing other <laughs> things? Um, actually, no, because <laughs> I'm at a, I'm at a kind of like a growth phase and financially intentional, which takes a lot, a lot of capital right now. So I'm actually increasing my hours. So I'm like increasing hours all across the board so that I can get to a place where it just kind of, where I kind of like coast. And so hopefully by the middle of next year, I'll get to a point where the business is self-sustaining and just running on its own. And then I can just take as much time off as I want to. I want to get to this idea of being in a growth phase and financially intentional. But before we get there, let's talk about nursing in general. You called nursing a cheat code. Do you feel the same way when it comes to fire and financial independence? Is it a good way to achieve financial independence? Oh, my God. <laughs> I would almost recommend like people who want to fire just to be a nurse. <laughs> And maybe just a nurse in California, because we just make really good money and we have, you know, breaks and all of those kind of things. And we're not like (laughs) sacrificial lambs for hospitals like other places. But I think because the ability to come out as a new grad and first of all, you can be a nurse out of like community college. And and let me be clear that with both of my master's degrees, I make the same as a nurse with the same years of experience that went to that that just has a community college degree. So, you could come out of community college, make a really decent salary and really accelerate like your savings so that work is optional in 10 to 15 years easily as a nurse. And just the options of being a nurse, like you can be a nurse from home, you can be a nurse, you can travel the world and be a nurse and just all those things that people aspire to in the fire community. I really feel like nurses just have a, a gamut of uh, like a full array of opportunities to kind of like exploit that. And so, yeah, I think that's why I say nursing is a cheat code because it's just so many options within nursing, but with a high income. Even in a high cost of living area, because I mean, you live, I don't know where you live currently, but you lived in Oakland and you were working in the San Francisco area. I mean, we're talking about really high cost of living places, even there, it's still very reasonable. I mean, like, okay, so high cost of living. And so that's the whole thing. It's like, how do you want to live? Like, are you really inflating your lifestyle? Like, there is options. Um, So I live, I still live in the Bay Area. I live in like the suburbs. (laughs) And that's more for my kids to be able to like go to school. Like, I just don't want them to get shot going to school, walking down the street in Oakland. There's no parts to play in and all that kind of stuff. And that's my home. But it's just different when raising kids. So I think you what happens is you have to be really creative um, in the Bay Area to not let your cost of living inflate, right? So uh, one of the things that I do is I own a home, but even when I was renting, I always made sure that I had an extra space that I can rent out to other nurses. That's going to decrease my housing costs because the thing that's going to get you is your housing and transportation, Right. And so my housing costs are drastically reduced by these travel nurses that come and stay with me or my coworkers (laughs) because a lot of people, they're not travel nurses here. They're actually staff nurses that live in different areas. And so they just need a stable place to, to live. And so they'll just they just have a room in your house and they pay for monthly. And so that's what I, um, that's what I do to keep my expenses down. But yeah, I mean, but there are other places that are totally affordable to live. And the thing about that big hospital organization who shall not be named (laughs) is that they've kind of changed the game so that you can live in a 
like more suburban area that has a lower cost of living. But because the union has negotiated the salaries as the same as Oakland and San Francisco, you you benefit from that same high salary. But, you know, your cost of living is drastically lower. So let's spend a few moments talking about your platform. First and foremost, what does it mean to be financially intentional? What what is the what does the name of your platform mean exactly? For me, especially when I was like thinking about what I wanted to call it, to me it meant like what was that one thing that really changed in me that made me be able to take control of my finances? What what shifted for me? And it was really like that intentionality, like being intentional about the money that came in and went out. So that's what intentionality means to me. Like just like paying attention and being in control of your money and your spending. And so, um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's where it came from. Like I really was like, what is the that one thing that keeps on coming up? Yeah. And what we're really talking about here is mindset more than it's, actual physical knowledge or skills. Yes, yes. I mean, you as you see, I I I, I knew how to make money. I just didn't know what to do with it. And then it was just about like, like just, yeah, shifting my mindset and being like, hey, these are the things that need to happen. But it was really mind over matter. Like it was really just like, okay. It it, it, it wasn't, like I said, I often say like people like, did you make more? No. Did you spend less? No. (laughs) I just was, I just paid attention to how I was spending money. Yeah. We've talked about the spending too much side of the equation. Let's go to the other side. What does deprivation look like in people's lives? Because one thing I've seen very clearly on your blog, especially, is warning against deprivation. You say multiple times you don't have to live that kind of life. What does that look like for most people? I think people think that they have to cut back and, you know, only cook at home and, you know, only drive, beat up you know, cars. And and if that's what you like, that's fine. But the thing is, is that if you're forcing yourself to do that, just to meet these goals, it's going to have a rebound effect. And you're really like, you might be doing well for a little bit, but it's not going to really serve you. There are people who love to live like that and that's fine, but you have to understand what sparks joy in your life. You have to understand, you know, what, you really care about. And the thing is, is if you just focus on the things that you care about and cut out all the stuff and all the spending, like, you know, you go to Target and you see the little $5 section and you just spend on that just because you can afford it. A lot of people do that and it's mindless spending and they just don't understand those things don't really matter to them, but they just do it because, oh, it's cheap and they can, and they can kind of justify it. But you'll see that those things start to accumulate. But then when you actually sit down and look at your money and say, I am going to make sure that like for me, when I first started, it was really important to me for to take my daughter to Disneyland like every couple of months. And I built that into my budget. And that's expensive. I live in Northern California. Disneyland is an eight hour drive. I never drove. I flew. But, you know, you have to pay for Disneyland, which is hella expensive, a hotel, you know, your flight. But I built that into my budget. And a lot of people would be like, oh, my God, like that's a lot. But to me, that's what kept me going, being able to afford that and to pay cash for that, not have to be de- dependent on credit cards to fund these things and to, and to be able to meet my debt payoff goals at the same time. Like to me, that was empowering. And that's what kept me going. You and I both started on this personal finance journey before the pandemic, right? 2015, 16, 17, we were going kind of through the thick of it. How do you think the pandemic, the associated recession and the downturn we're going through now, how do you think it's affecting people? Is it changing the basic rules or should we continue doing what we're doing? It doesn't change the rules. It does change people's mentality around it. And for the first time in a long time, I'm like hearing this thing about people are like, I I'm, I see all this money I'm losing in my 401k and they're going back to this thing that I remember happening like in the recession, like this panic, like, oh, I need to start hoarding my money or putting it into this like savings account, even though they're learning this information and understanding that a lot of people that you see that are millionaires right now came out of this last recession by making just one or two really smart financial decisions and just sticking to that plan. 
not understanding that. And so a lot of it is like that mindset of kind of just like being afraid and working out of fear. And even though, you know, how your brain kind of works, like even though your logical brain can tell you one thing, when fear overrides that and you go into like this state of like survival, that's where a lot of people are. And so at least for my audience who are like relatively newer to just learning about finances, who, you know, were never taught just like me about finances and are really just trying to get in the game. And I'm like, oh yeah, but you have to invest in order to like build wealth. And they're just like, invest? Like, why would I put money in the stock market? And like, and like really trying to help them understand that this is how you build wealth. And this is like how the stock market works. You know, that's, that's what you pay for with higher returns. Like there's going to be downturns really having to repeat those messages over and over. You mentioned earlier that financially intentional, the platform is in the midst of a growth phase. Tell us what that means. What are you building? So for me, it's about like, being able to run this platform on autopilot, um, like this has been like a, a labor of love. And so therefore it could be very expensive, you know, and it's not like I was really um, putting, I wasn't like charging a lot of information. It wasn't like a revenue generating thing for me initially. It was really about me just putting information out there so people can learn. But <laughs> I wanted to do it in a way that it was self-sustaining financially because I was supporting it on my nursing income. And so that means I wanted to, I felt like I had to build a lot of structures in place so that if I do have to step away, the platform can continue to grow because I feel like it's important. And so that does take a lot of capital up front to build in automations, to have people that work for me that can do these things. And so um, even if you're not, and, and, and you have to be able to generate revenue in order to do that. And so just putting those things into place right now so that if I need to step away for whatever reason, for a couple months, or you know, I the, the, the platform still exists and is still of value. Well, Nasima McElroy, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show today. You know, from this conversation, it's clear we think of building our income. We think of making a lot of money, but clearly that doesn't solve our problems. Yes, we need money to move forward. We need money to pay off debt. But until we become intentional about how we live and how we spend that money, we're not going to make much headway. You didn't until you realized that certainly... My friend who I talked about in the introduction who was a plastic surgeon didn't until she realized that she had to pay more attention with what she was doing with her money. I want to end the show the way I end every show by asking you what is up next in your life and where can we find you? Nazima, tell us what's going on with you. What's coming up over the next few months? I'm super excited to be able to relaunch my podcast. Initially, it was called Nurses on Fire because I'm focusing on introducing nurses to the fire community. But I really want to bring the message of financially intentional to everyone. And so I'm rebranding my podcast to the Financially Intentional Podcast and, you know, bringing more people on to just talk about financial independence in general. That's going to launch December 1st. So I'm super excited about that. But, you know, in general, I'm always hanging out on Instagram. I have resource free, a lot of free resources there, opportunities to work with me. You can find me on Financially Intentional. You might even see me as the face of some of these <laughs> financial technology companies. You know, if you're scrolling TikTok, you might, is that Nasima? That's Nasima. So I also do some community building for um, some financially tech, financial technology companies. So You'll see me around on Instagram and on the TikTok. So that's and where you can find me. Mm -hmm. What is your Instagram and TikTok handles? Oh, ah, that's <laughs> important, right? So you can find me on Instagram at Financially Intentional. Um, on TikTok, which is not a large community, but you can find me at Nasima RN or just search for Financially Intentional. And I'm there. That's me. This has been the Earn and Invest Podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Nasima McElroy. That's a wrap. All right, I continue things going just to catch that after show chatter so that we'll 
put it as the after show. Um, yeah, definitely excited for financially intentional for your relaunch of your podcast. I totally agree as a creator listening to what you're saying with this idea of kind of taking it out of nursing, which is a population, but it's still a limited population. And Mm -hmm. I would also tell you something to consider is don't only limit yourself to this financial independence meme, because there's a lot of people who are into personal finance who can learn and grow from what you're talking about being financially intentional, who aren't really focused on this whole idea of financial independence, but yet still want to build a stable financial framework. I know certainly with this podcast, I try to, we talk about FI and FIRE a lot, but I try to make sure that we also broaden it because there are a lot of people who that particular flavor doesn't excite them, Mm -hmm. but they actually are interested in earning and investing and learning and thinking more about what they do with their money. Right. So like I um, have kind of structured the podcast to be like, you know, the more these are more financial topics that you just didn't yeah. even know you needed to know. Yeah. So it's not it's not fire. It's not a fire band. It's like really just like talking about finances in a way that a lot of people just never even thought about and opportunities that they never imagined was possible for them. So that's that's kind of it's more about, you know, exposing them to different avenues of wealth building um career building things like that and just options like if they want to step away like what is that what are your options yeah so yeah that's and you what i'm hoping to get you have a lot of different angles right because you have the nursing angle you have the debt angle you have the growing up with scarcity angle i mean these are all kind of they're adjacent but they're all connected and so that's what's kind of cool is you have like lots of different areas to pull from and I think like talking about like building black wealth too, because I don't know if you know, but like it's anticipated that, you know, the net worth of, of black Americans is going to go to zero in a couple of years. Yeah, which and is like, just crazy. Yeah. It, but it, but it's a reality and people don't understand really what that means. And like being able to talk about that, but then also like highlighting like systemically and historically the, like the contracts yeah. around it. And like how to overcome those things is super important to talk about, even in like estate planning and stuff like my um, estate planning attorney is like really good at highlighting those issues. Like, yeah, you can go and get like a typical like fill in the blank estate plan. But is this really going to address like the fact that you your husband might be in jail? You know, like because of these systemic issues, like how do we have to we have to look at things a little bit differently. And so being able to bring that perspective into the world of personal finance and things that, you know, aren't readily talked about is really exciting for me. Yeah. And, you know, it's such a difficult subject, black wealth specifically. Right. Because we as a community, um, the people who do a really good job of this often talk about personal responsibility which works for people who are already really very motivated. Yes. The problem is if we really want to reach large swaths of the population, there is political and systemic problems. People are not, don't have low in net worths because they want to, right? Like if we <laughs> say that probably the average of intelligence over the U S is equal for all racial groups, right? They're probably mm-hmm. pretty close. When you take the average intelligence, average abilities, average skills, the truth of the matter is it's probably fairly similar through all racial groups in the United States. We have all kind of have at least some bit of that similar culture, but what we don't have is a similar history and we don't have a similar legislation and we don't have similar politics and Our access. <laughs> and so it's, I mean, we, we can, and I don't, I shouldn't even say we, I would say people of color who teach other people of color how to deal with their finances can take the people who are already very motivated and teach them the personal habits that will help them get over kind of the crappy system that's in place. But that's only still a small part of any population is the people who are totally motivated. The question is, how do we kind of lift up the people who also aren't motivated? And that and that that crosses racial borders. It's just unfortunately people of color have gotten, you know, the worst of the situation through history. So the need is much greater. Right. From history and from the financial system and being Uh, taken advantage of. I mean, I don't know if you know if you saw this but you know one of my followers got like scammed out of thirty thousand dollars that she that was like probably like her life savings you know yeah, and yeah. these things like happen over and over to people who are just really trying to get ahead and look how defeated is you know defeating is that yeah. well yeah and it 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 
it it fulfills that story that people tell themselves that money is not for them and that it'll never work. And the minute they make money, someone's going to take it away. And so if you grow up with that, if that's what your parents had and your siblings and your friends and your friends' parents and everyone you saw on Sunday at church, if they all have that same story and then you go through it personally, like, why would you ever try harder? Like, why would you? Yeah. You know, I just remember like not even thinking that, and this was not that long ago. It was like right before I started my journey, just thinking like the only way to get rich is like to do it illegally yeah. or, you know, and so like people buy into these scams because it like, it sounds like that's the way that people get rich. I, you know, I grew up like dating drug dealers and, you know, you have them. Um, you know, five hundred dollars, and, and, and those are the people who have money. Thousand yeah. dollars, exactly. Yeah. That's the whole thing, and so it doesn't sound like a scam. It sounds like you really about to come up, and so it's just it's just heartbreaking for me. But to be able to be on this side and be like, you know what, it doesn't have to be like that. It's really empowering, um, but also I feel a whole lot of response, personal responsibility, and it can be heavy. <laughs> Most times, I want to quit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine. I imagine <laughs> that you feel a lot of personal responsibility to impart now this knowledge and said, okay, like I've found a way to move forward to make life better. It's not going to get better unless people like me start helping other people do it. I, I, I imagine that's a huge weight of responsibility. It is. It which, is. which most of us in the content creation world don't have. Like if I don't teach other doctors how to make a lot of money or be financially independent, you know what? Okay. They'll be fine. Right. <laughs> right. Like we're not talking about like the systemic consequences of me not, you know, educating other doctors on how to be financially independent. Yeah. Right. 